Okay. Uh, good afternoon and buonasera ai nostri ospiti che ci seguono dall'Italia. Welcome to the first digital Italian table talk, Now What? Critical Thoughts and Practical Strategy on Restoring Our Restaurant. My name is uh, Gianfranco Sorrentino. I am the managing partner of Il Gatto Pardo Group, and I am also the president of Gruppo Italiano, a not-for-profit organization that uh, promoted Italian culinary culture here in the, in the United States. Uh, let me thank Elias Lee, founder of Filin, for helping us organize and run the technology for this uh, webinar. Also, let me thank our sponsor, Filin, Simona Cazzaniga from All About Italy, Sally Fisher from uh, Sally Fisher PR. And also, I have to announce that with uh, the help of uh, Accent PR of Daniela Puglielli, GI is now expanding in other cities like uh, Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston, Houston, Los Angeles, Washington, and uh, Miami. Uh, let me thank also the Italian Trade Agency and the Italian Trade Commission and Nino Laspina for their general support, as well as the Paola Bola Sorrentino and David Ernst who produced this event. Uh, it's my privilege and pleasure now to introduce the Italian Consul General, Mr. Francesco Genuardi, who would like to say a few words of greetings. Uh, Signor Consul, prego. Grazie. Good afternoon, everybody. Buon pomeriggio. Uh, a tutti, buonasera a chi ci segue dall'Italia. Uh, thank you Gianfranco, thank you Gruppo Italiano. I think this is a very uh, important and timely uh, initiative. I always praise uh, you as a leader of Gruppo Italiano for this very uh, important and uh, substantial Italian table talks. And uh, now I can say that also you are a visionary man because you uh, you set up this kind of, uh, of talks uh, well before the COVID emergency, but already with a view to the future, saying that these were talks uh, that were regarding the, the tomorrow of the, of the culinary scene of all the, the, the restorators and the hospitality uh, protagonists. Of course, now we are uh, May the 5th, uh, we are in full uh, COVID era, and uh, your initiative is, is another example of uh, how much uh, also the Italian community in New York, uh, in the tri-state area, is, uh, is fully active in a smart Zooming activities. Uh, of course, uh, the impact of the, of the COVID in the, the New York State uh, culinary scene is devastating. You already uh, wrote uh, in your uh, invitation some uh, really scary uh, figures about uh, the, the perspective. So I think that uh, you really had uh, the great idea in uh, joining today uh, so many important person of the New York scene uh, from the, the, the journalistic world, the real estate world, the, the, the retail, the restorators, of course, and then the legal counsel. Uh, because, of course, uh, it's, it's one of the most urgent problems are uh, very practical and uh, you have set up a dream team of people i think that can give uh, help you to give the first answers uh, on my part as a consul general of italy in new york as a representative of italian institutions here uh, let me be very clear uh, about the fact that, that i'm sure that uh, you uh, all the people who are following us now the, the people of uh, protagonists of hospitality agri food industry restorators entrepreneur you you are still and you will be uh, forever the protagonist of this city so i'm uh, i'm sure that you will find uh, we will find all together the right uh, measure the right initiative is in the near future Future to keep uh, uh, thriving this, uh, this sector, which is so essential for the city, for the state, but also so essential for, for Italy, because Italy really thrives, enjoys this uh, absolutely privileged relationship and partnership and friendship with the city of New York, thanks of, uh, to, the, to you, to your activities, to your uh, creativity, and to your uh, capacity of innovation, as you always uh, have uh, very much highlighted, dear uh, Gianfranco. 
And uh, I think uh, this is a time uh, very important for reflection, but also for actions. And I know that uh, you are a very much action-oriented uh, group. Uh, so, grazie davvero di questa iniziativa. Be sure that uh, the Consulate General of Italy in New York is alive and kicking. Uh, it's, of course, closed, open just for the emergency, but very operational and open with uh, two uh, emergency lines and email uh, 24 hours a day and night. And uh, we are ready, of course, also to take and receive some suggestion from you. How can we uh, help? How can we invent, for example, a big uh, a common initiative of all the Italian restaurateurs in New York City in the, in the near future? We have, I think, a lot of Italian pride in this city. We share uh, between New York and uh, Italy, an amazing amount of resiliency. We have been hardly hit both uh, by this uh, terrible uh, virus, but I think we have all the will, all the means, all the capacity to uh, to take the scene again and to to make an uh, Italy and uh, New York uh, two big protagonists of the world scene in in food in. Uh, in uh, restoration, in hospitality. So, grazie mille, and let me conclude uh, with the old and uh, never-ending, everlasting motto, Viva l'Italia, Viva New York, and uh, I'm sure that there will be very fruitful works uh, in this webinar this afternoon. Grazie a tutti. Grazie a lei, signor Console, per il supporto che ci dà. Thank you very much, and Viva l'Italia. So, today Italian Table Talks will explore in depth the ongoing debate surrounding two very important topics and they are going to change and hopefully benefit our industry. These topics would apply to any restaurant anywhere in the country. It is a rent relationship and the federal government the PPP programs. Uh, we have brought together top experts in their respective field to express a different point of view and make a practical suggestion for us to reopen it. Let me now invite today's guest speaker, Steve Corso, who is the food and real estate editor of the New York Post. Uh, Steve, please. Thank you. Thank you, Gianfranco. Welcome, esteemed, our esteemed panelists, and thank you, Gianfranco, and of course, our moderator, for inviting me back to deliver Grupo Italiano's keynote remarks. I am deeply honored. Of course, my speech must be very different than last year's, which touched on many topics that now seem quaint, such as the way critics write about Italian restaurants and what the word Italian really means. That world seems very, very long ago. Only one issue lies before us today, the future and survival, not only of Italian restaurants, but of all restaurants, from mom and pop noodle shops to French restaurants with three Michelin stars. The topic takes on added urgency in light of Governor Cuomo's announcement on Monday that for the first time hinted at a rough sequence for reopening the state's businesses. The good news of a sort uh, <laughs> is that restaurants ought to be part of the third phase of reopening. No one knows when that will be, but it's better than the fourth phase, which includes performing arts and entertainment. And it's certainly better than the outlook for spectator sports, which I don't think the governor will even mentioned. Um, unless uh, New York State and City's current trending reductions in hospitalizations and deaths uh, were to reverse, uh, it's possible that restaurants will start to reopen a few months from now. The lockdown has exacted a terrible toll on owners, uh, on 370,000 former employees in the city alone who have lost their livelihoods at a stroke, and of course on the many millions of us uh, for whom dining out is a major part of our, of our lives. No one knows yet how many places will reopen and on what basis. Danielle Hume has said that the future is questionable even for 11 Madison Park. My many friends who own less famous mid-sized restaurants are confident that they will reopen, but it's what comes after that that's keeping them up at night. The challenges ahead are so many, unfamiliar and complex. It's hard to know where to begin. I'll note them to the best of my understanding. It might be best to express them in question form, given that our panelists are much better equipped than I am to suggest answers. Number one, real estate and leases. Restaurateurs can't pay their rent without revenue, but landlords are in a similar bind to pay their mortgages. 
without government mandated relief, the whole structure might collapse. Some New York landlords are even threatening to hold restaurant owning tenants personally liable for the full terms of their lease. Gabriel Stillman, who faces just such a dilemma, has urged the city council to protect restaurant operators from such dire steps. There's no general consensus among restaurateurs on how to proceed in dealing with their landlords. Some, like Boqueria chain owner Jan de Rochefort, want government to, as he put it, stop time and institute a moratorium on commercial and residential rents, mortgage and debt payments, banks can and will be backstopped by the government. Well, that's, as he wrote, that's <laughs> certainly one view. Um, others are privately talking to their landlords about rent deferrals or outright forgiveness. Others still say there's no point doing that until a clearer reopening timeline emerges. Uh, it's really the wild west out there. Uh, landlords, for their part, say there's no way they'll give restaurants a free pass, but they're open to discussions on a case-by-case -case basis. They certainly don't want more vacant space than they've already got a retail space than they already have on their hands. So recognizing that restaurants and their landlords are partners of a sort, um, how do they work together to clear a path for, for a viable future? Number two, density limits and customer resistance. Owing to their nature as socializing vendors, reopened restaurants will face a harder challenge than retail stores. Social distancing, even in relaxed form, is a dilemma for managers and their customers alike. Some owners I've spoken to, including uh, La Bernardin's uh, uh, great uh, Eric Repair, are more worried over how they'll be impacted by future density rules than about whether they'll reopen. Most owners are lucky to enjoy 10% profits, and they say they can't survive on 50% or less capacity, just won't cover operating costs. Uh, Mermaid Inn downtown on 10th Avenue lost not half, but 70% of its revenue during the few days of 50% seating uh, that preceded the full lockdown. Um, meanwhile, from the customer experience, will customers balk at wider space seating which d diminishes the buzz that's a big part of New York restaurant going experience. Um, optimists, including myself, believe that New Yorkers will return in droves after some initial hesitation. After all, people already ignoring social distancing rules in parks and on beaches, and some are even booking cruises. So why won't they have a similar attitude in restaurants? But no one knows for sure because we've never been in such uncharted waters. Modest sized places might be able to finesse the new rules, but what about jumbos with hundreds of seats where dense crowding is part of the thrill? Uh, think of the Tower Group restaurants or, or places like Carmine's and Trattoria del Arte. Um, I've talked to some of the owners um, and they're strategizing behind the scenes with their chefs and lawyers and accountants and architects to come up with viable new business plans. Um, maybe it'll be easier for restaurants with 100 seats, uh, places of the size of El Gato Pardo, than it will be for places with 400 seats. Number three, government support. The federal payroll protection plan, part of the $3 trillion stimulus package, notoriously did next to nothing to help small and medium and mid-sized restaurants. The loan relief packages given to chains giant chains such as Shake Shack and Ruth's Chris Steakhouse were such a public embarrassment that their owners were shamed into giving them back, at least, at least some of them were. Um, a recent $310 billion addition to the plan is supposedly aimed at truly small businesses. Will that really help restaurants? Is there any further relief in the, in the cards coming in the next uh, few months, the new legislation? Closer to home, what can New York City and state do to provide owners with immediate relief, both during the lockdown period and beyond the reopening? Can the current six-month eviction prohibition rule be extended for long enough, long enough further for operators to find their footing? On the landlord side, shouldn't the city defer property tax payments beyond July when they're due? It's easy to call property owners cruel and heartless, but they're in their own bind. Helping landlords with their creditors, with their lenders, with their banks, helping landlords will make it easier for them to help their tenants. 
Finally, number four, refinancing after the lockdowns end. Uh, Tom Colicchio has said that up to 75% of restaurants won't, eat, won't survive the crisis. Not everyone agrees with his gloomy uh, numbers. In any event, a lot will depend on how soon reopening can occur. We still don't know if we're talking about June or August or September. Of those restaurants which do come through at whatever point, most, especially in the small and medium-sized class, the ones that don't have backing from sovereign wealth funds, will scramble to uh, will will be scrambling to restore their balance sheets after going, having gone for months without revenue. What funding avenues uh, will be open to them uh, on, on on the equity side on on, on the debt side? Will mom and pop eateries in relatively lower rent avenues, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, in, in lower rent sections of the outer boroughs actually have an easier time to get these started than mid sized venues in Manhattan? Think of chains um, like Serafina and Blue Ribbon. Um, New York restaurants have defied every previous prediction of doom. After 9 11, the 2008 financial crash, and Hurricane Sandy. It's easy to forget that even the smoking ban was once regarded by some people as an existential threat. I think <laughs> listening to my friends who own restaurants, I think I might have even written a column making exactly that argument. And now, of course, it seems silly. Uh, the COVID crisis is different in magnitude and its tragic dimensions and its disruptive power. Uh, let's see what our panelists have to say about putting it behind us. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, Steve. Uh, now, let me uh, introduce our uh, panelists and the moderator. Uh, our moderator is Mitchell Davis. He is the chief strategy officer of the James Beer Foundation, a cookbook author, a food journalist, and a scholar with a PhD in food studies from the New York University. But what is more important for us, Italian, is that Mitchell assembled and lead the team that was selected by the U.S. Department of State and created the U.S. Pavilion at Expo Milano 2015. Our panelists, uh, we have William Dahill, partner Dannington Bartolo Miller LLP, an expert on federal, state, and city financial support. In the field of real estate to discuss rents and level of the relations, we invite Steve Soundtich, uh, executive Managing Director of Cushman and Wakefield. And as a restaurateur, we invite uh, Dino Bori from Italy, which at the last moment had to cancel, so I'm going to sit in in case uh, you need me. Uh, Mitchell, is all yours. Thank you, Gianfranco, and thank you, Steve, for such a comprehensive and, and um, I think, very um, realistic portrayal of what's going on right now in restaurants in the United States. Before we get into some of the very technical conversation that I think will come because our panelists are experts in very specific pieces of the program, I just wanted to add a couple of um, highlights uh, from Steve's talk to, to take this nationally and internationally because although this is a crisis that is affecting the world right now. Um, one of the things we're seeing in the United States that makes it particularly complicated is that we're not seeing a national response, if you will. So we have this funny situation right now where restaurants in New York have no idea, as Steve said, when they might open, and restaurants in uh, Georgia or in Texas um, are able to open now, but making the difficult decisions about whether or not they can protect their employees, whether or not consumers will behave in ways that um, support a sort of hygienic operation, and, and whether or not their very um, existence as a business can sustain whatever decision they think is right morally. So it, it's the, the complex case is, is means that um, the standards about what with which a restaurant has to open are challenging to figure out. And as an organization, the James Beard Foundation has tried to step in where we've um, seen a lack of some leadership um, just on behalf of the independent restaurants and others that, that um, make up the $16 million industry that we all are a part of in order to um, give some, some sense of, of um, consistency across the country. 
And uh, I'll just say that to do that, uh, we helped start something called the IRC, the Independent Restaurant Coalition, which uh, Steve re re referenced um, some work that Tom Calicchio was doing. Well, restaurants from all over the country have joined together to try to represent themselves in Washington in a way that would be unique to the independent restaurants of the sector. So obviously there are large chains um, and there are franchises and all sorts of folks who have a long established um, powerful lobby in Washington, but when two or three trillion dollars or more likely are on the table um, and they go to the loudest, squeakiest people, you need to be represented in ways that that um, help your business. And one of the things that I think has been really um, eye-opening for most of the pub public and even our legislatures, if not anyone working in the restaurants, is how precarious the restaurant business model is and has always been. Let's let's not lie. We've talked about that in previous conversations here. This is not a high margin. Uh, let's cash it in, even though they're rest eating in restaurants is not cheap um, and limited for to many who would sort of find themselves in an affluent sector. They are they are not cash cows as one might imagine, and this has really revealed. The problems there, the lack of cash flow, the the, the way that distributors are supporting um, uh, through cash flow, sort of tonight's dinners paid for yesterday's uh, ingredients, those sorts of things. And and I think one of the challenges that we see in some of the topics that we're going to discuss with our panelists is that um, although um, you can't really write a legislation that um, that at, at the level of an entire country, an entire small business sector, and three trillion dollars that addresses every uh, individual sector's needs, the restaurant sector is particularly um, was was faced a, faced a, a unique situation, um, both in how it operates and also in the fact that it's the only sector was the first sector to have to close before others even knew that there was a problem or, or something to contend with. So I, I say these things not not to excuse them. You, the audience, presumably knows more about the situation than I do, but. But the, you, I think what's been revealed is the uniqueness of the independent restaurant sector or the restaurants, how restaurants work in general. And also, I would add, as an organization that's, that's focused on the cultural value of restaurants, you know, the easiest way to demonstrate um, after 30 plus years that we've been trying to show people that restaurants and chefs and food is really important is to just take it away immediately. So you lose the, you lose the life of the street, the sort of community sense of the neighborhood, and you lose a kind of... Um, cultural aspiration or value that that obviously we all think is really important and it's one of the things that keeps us in this business. So I, you know, it's an incredibly difficult time. We, we as an organization who've given away millions of dollars to help restaurants sustain themselves, hear stories that just, you know, you could cry at yourself to sleep every day when you hear people working really hard to try to keep their businesses, their employees, um, their, their clients safe. It, it's crazy. At the same time, I think there's a real opportunity here because there's a realization of the value that this sector contributes to daily life in ways we never, we, in ways some of us always took for granted, let's say. And I'm not just talking, I'll also add, about restaurants at the highest level, the most famous James Beard Award winners or Michelin star earners. I'm talking about the restaurants on the corner that you just take for granted, that you go get your coffee or that you wave to people in the window as you walk by if you live in New York or places that really hold complete communities together, immigrant populations, um, uh, neighborhoods, even um, real estate developments. So I use that as a context to add a little bit of color to Steve's remarks, which I, again, I think were just so thorough because we have some real expertise with us. And, and um, I think we start um, with the, the I, I'd like to start, if we may, with the overview of, of the real estate situation, because so much of what we're seeing right now in the city, you know, I, I think as you walk down the streets, the, the, if you lived in New York, and Steve alluded to this, you, you were surprised lately before the COVID epidemic of the boarded up for rent um, spaces and prime real estate of this city. So there was something going on. Now the fact that all the life has been drained from the streets lends in a kind of apocalyptic air and to, to, if you're still in the city, to, to life in this town and in every town. And yet um, what happens between a restaurant and its landlord um, is and has always been key to the success of the business. Your lease, I went to the Cornell Hotel School, we learned, you know, in Hotel uh, Restaurant Management 101, that, that your lease was the make or break situation. If you didn't approach it properly, it didn't matter how many meals you sold or how many people came through, um, you weren't gonna survive. And so now we find ourselves, as Steve laid out, in a situation where people are asked to take 50% or a quarter of the business, the same relationships it, once you open and not even knowing that. And so I wanna, 
I, I think that that's a really interesting place to start from the perspective of the restaurateur and the business. And so I'm going to pivot and uh, to Steve and to just ask you to give us a lay of the land right now from your perspective and and where we are and what you see as the possibilities, the opportunities um, to emerge from this this situation in any way as a restaurant um, whole, if you will, or to some extent on the way to wholeness. Absolutely. Thank you, Mitchell. Um, I've had over the last eight weeks, um, dozens and dozens of conversations with both restaurateurs and landlords, whether they were large institutional real estate investment trusts or co-op boards or more local mom and pop landlords. And I've developed some clarity on most of those conversations. I would say that 95 out of 100 landlord tenant relationships between restaurateurs and landlords, provided that there has been open communication, and that is a very important thing to, to note, have been very friendly and very um, am amicable. Um, to date, there have been a handful of instances, and Steve Cuso mentioned one of them in the instance of Gabe Spoolman downtown, who has an unfortunate situation where he has some challenging landlords who are not as thoughtful as many of the other landlords in town, um, who are suing them for the entire rent and potentially uh, their personal guarantee under the lease. It sounds like the city council is going to take that up uh, and the real estate community is totally supportive of it. I don't believe, nor does anybody, uh, that it is equitable for a landlord when a restaurant is closed to expect rent from that restaurant. And I think most um, landlords have abided by that. And it's not just a sense of equanimity or goodwill, although there is a lot of that. And there is a sense that we are all in this together and it is no one's fault per se, certainly not a restaurant tour's fault. Um, but it's also a lack of good options. So if you're a landlord and you have a tenant who has not paid rent because they haven't been open for two months, or you have a tenant who's communicated with you and says, you know, obviously I haven't paid rent March and April and May. I expect to be open sometime in mid June, but at 50%. And I have no idea what the next three, six, nine months looks like in terms of my top line, but I'm certain that I won't be able to pay the contractual rent that I'm obligated to under our previous lease. And we need to work something out. Most landlords are, have expected that conversation and are open to that conversation. I think Steve mentioned it. Um, there's no sense in really finalizing that now without some sort of certainty as to what A, a reopening looks like in terms of time, and B, what restrictions vis-a-vis -vis social distancing mean for restaurant operationally. Uh, you know, is it 25% occupancy? Is it 50% occupancy? What does that do to your back of house? Do you need the same dishwashers that you needed before? Do you need the same front of house staff? Um, all those things are gonna come into question. And I think almost every landlord in New York expects to have that and is open to that conversation because the alternative is you take back the keys and the restaurant goes away and you're left with a vacant restaurant space. Now, what does that mean in today's leasing environment where no leases are getting signed? Why would you want that if you were a landlord? What, why is that a beneficial alternative? First of all, assume that the rent will go down precipitously anyway. You'll have to give a new tenant substantial free rent or concessions, whether it's TI contribution dollars, landlord work, or just a substantial amount of free rent anyway. And then you're stuck with a restaurant that you don't, a restaurant tour and operator that you don't know. Better the devil you do. Um, so I think that that's obviously informing most of these conversations. It is a sense of community. It is a sense that we're all in this together. Don't get me wrong, but the alternatives just aren't better. So um, most of those conversations, with the exception of a few bad apples, who I just, I don't think they have any other default mode other than. Where's the rent? Where's the rent? Where's the rent? Um, the bulk of the landlords in New York have been much more open. And I do, I do need to say, though, with communication from their tenants, I, it, it, where tenants have what they call ghosted their landlords and said, I'm not returning your calls. I'm not even going to communicate with you. You just don't expect the rent and you can't find me anywhere. That's a little bit more of a, a difficult conversation. Um, but for the most part, that, that rarely happens as well. Thanks. Hope that answers. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Yeah, that I think that's a great setting, and I it, it uh, leads me to um, two threads that I'd like to pick up on. One is uh, 
I know of at least one major landlord, Jamestown Properties, that actually established a $50 million fund to support the businesses because they recognize that their model of mixed use um, gains value from the, the dynamic sort of retail level in their properties. Do you, are there other stories like th that kind of relationship? I mean, I haven't probed into the details of it, but it seemed rather um, innovative. Yeah, I mean, almost any landlord who has relied over the last few years on food and beverage operators to drive traffic to mixed use developments. Jamestown is arguably one of the pioneers of it. And you think about Chelsea Market and, and their development of that and Ponce in, uh, in Atlanta. But, you know, Jeff Blau from Related talked about um, the obligation for their larger tenants in Hudson Yards to pay rent so that they could give their food and beverage tenants rent uh, abatements and deferrals and future deferrals during a difficult time. So, you know, basically any institutional landlord who has relied on food and beverage, and I think that for the most part, if you've developed a big office building, a big residential building, a, a multi-use complex in New York or anywhere over the last 10 years, you've had to implement a substantial food and beverage component as, as a traffic driver. So you are already probably the partner with most of those restaurateurs. I know that Related is on most of the operations in Hudson Yards. So they, of course, are going to be working with those tenants going forward. And I think most landlords who have helped build those restaurants or I implemented percentage rent deals before COVID are going to continue those going forward. Thanks for that. I, anecdotally, um, you, you know, Washington State and Seattle in particular were hit before New York um, with COVID. And after we heard from restaurateurs in industrial work areas that it, the stay at home, um, the work from home sort of orders of, of employers hit them the hardest. That, that was the first wave before they were forced to close. Some had to actually permanently close because, as you say, uh, if, you're not, if no one's coming into work, no one's having lunch and dinner there either. So, um, complicated. But the second thing I want to pick up and I wanted to use for a conversation to bring Bill into, into this um, is you, you emphasize the need for relationship with your landlord and um, the IRC and in some of the work that we've been doing at Beard educating uh, chefs and restaurateurs about how to um, access PPP and how to answer all the unanswered questions. We keep coming back to this idea that your relationship with your banker is really important. And, and so um, I, I think I want to use that as a segue to talk a little bit about the, the Paycheck Protection Program, um, both its pluses and in the, in the area of restaurants, it's, it's my, more, more minuses, unfortunately, um, and the role that the relation, relationships play even there in this sort of giant um, Washington uh, bill, which requires, I think, entrepreneurs to really um, show up and lean into the people that they deal with. Do you want to give a little bit of an overview of the program, Bill, and, and some of the shortfalls vis-a-vis -vis restaurants? Sure, thank you, uh, Mitchell. Um, first, I gotta do a lawyer thing, um, which is that uh, this is a general discussion, um, shouldn't be taken as specific legal advice um, because any advice would have to depend on the specifics of a particular circumstance. Um, no action should be taken based on what I said, although if you have questions, you can follow up with a lawyer of your own choosing. This may be considered attorney advertising. Um, there, I, had, I said what I had to say to get that going. Um, also, let me just quickly say, uh, as somebody who's lived most of his life uh, in New York and in Manhattan in particular, um, that part of what makes this city so great is its restaurant scene. And candidly, I have great appreciation for the Italian restaurant scene. And uh, the importance of that, this industry coming back uh, can't be overstated. And um, picking up on something that Steve Cuso said, um, you know, I, I think once you guys, as much as you guys want to reopen, we want you reopened and uh, we'll find ways to make it work. So that's just a personal uh, statement about the circumstances. Um, the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, which has been the subject of such tremendous coverage um, for a number of reasons, including the kind of abuses of it, if you will, that um, Steve Cuso mentioned earlier, um, in, in essence is a program which for uh, restaurants which have up to, I mean, I'm going to focus on restaurants, it's obviously geared beyond that and frankly geared for other industries better than for restaurants. Um, for locations for up to 500 employees, um, a restaurateur was, uh, is eligible to obtain a loan 
uh, that's intended to be forgivable. I'll circle back to that. Um, that's calculated by 2.5 times your average payroll from a set period during the prior 12 months, um, which includes not only regular compensation, but also includes tips. Um, also, it is maxed out when you're doing that calculation at $100,000 per person when you're co computing what that average was. Um, that is the way in which these loans um, were, were calculated. Uh, the idea was that these loans would be available and would be largely forgivable based on a very particular formula. That formula, um, basically, which was in the original legislation and has not changed, is that from the moment you receive the, the, your, the loan is funded into your account, you have eight weeks of spending, which then needs to be spent on payroll, which can include components of health care and retirement plans, if applicable. It can include rent. It can include mortgage payments, if applicable to you. Uh, and it can include utilities. The way in which the, the forgiveness is determined is at the end of that eight-week period of that spend, uh, as long as 75% of that amount went to payroll, the amount that's spent in that eight week period then becomes forgiven. And there will be forms to be completed at the end with the lending institution uh, in order to demonstrate that you um, met those requirements. Um, for this particular industry, that has really led to a, particularly in a place like New York at least, where we aren't even started opening up restaurants yet, is, well, I don't have any employees anymore to pay. Um, at least not currently. Um, many of them are, have been laid off and taking advantage of the um, favorable um, unemployment program that was put into place. The bottom line is, is that the, if the money isn't spent, again, under the current rules, um, if the, um, sorry, if the, if the money is not spent in the manner prescribed by the, by the rules, it will not be forgiven at the end of that eight weeks. Um, there was a mention of Tom Colicchio earlier. I saw today there was a New Yorker magazine article published in which he basically shrugged his shoulders and said it's a way basically of paying unemployment for eight weeks, which is true. Now, there is one thing I want to mention here that I think sometimes people may lose track of with regard to these loans. Everybody, of course, wants the forgiveness. But the terms of these loans are pretty generous. And it's something people should think about, in, at least in giving terms of consideration because everybody rushed to say, I get quote unquote free money, but the other money you get that may not be forgiven is actually inexpensive money. The six month interest free, the interest rate is 1% and it has a two year um, payback period. Um, there is no prepayment penalty. And of course you've obtained these without providing a guarantee or, or, or similar um, or, or security. So I mention that for people to think about what may be the most logical way to use these funds, understanding that people may not wanna take any debt on, but when you consider some of the other programs, some of which are currently paused, but may come back into shape, or when the Main Street Lending Program kicks in, which may impact some of the larger scale restaurants, you know, this money may be considered, even if not forgiven, something that has value to the operation of the business, as long as it's spent in a manner consistent with what the purposes are, which would still be essentially rent, compensation, mortgage interest, and things of that nature. Um, the final thing I'll just pick up on, um, uh, Mitchell, to re reflect your comment about relationships is uh, I think bigger picture, I can tell you both, I can tell you from anecdotally, but from speaking with many, many people, um, the ability to get the loan through the first time had a much higher percentage rate of success for people who had relationships with smaller scale banks. That's just the way it was. You know, the Chases, the Bank of America's, the Wells Fargo's, for, the bottom line is it was more difficult. Um, you can also imagine if a $2 trillion program is put into place in, in, in about a week and everybody says, okay, start giving loans out, there is going to be some hiccups that occur. But the reality is, and I suggest people examine their banking relationships, smaller scale banks, and, and it wasn't even favoritism, from best I can tell. It was actually that it was easier to deal with these smaller institutions. They were more inclined to work with you as a business, and it may be a valuable time to reconsider you know, what your long-term banking relationship is. Thanks. Uh, we heard, I, everything I've heard said exactly the same. Um, so I appreciate that and that overview of the program. 
Um, let's let's take um, the sort of expert advice and go right to the heart of the matter. Jen Franco, I, I want to acknowledge both that um, your leadership for hosting a conversation like this is is uh, quite generous, but you are also in very much in the trenches dealing with this with businesses that are facing the same existential um, crises um, that we're discussing sort of at arm's length a little bit. So I want to first ask you how you're doing and then ask you to reflect a little bit on what you've just heard and what you see um, sort of in, in the very near future and then a little bit farther on the horizon as an operator um, of restaurants where people gathered um, voluntarily often and, and, um, and with such uh, joy. Uh, well, how I'm doing, uh, personally, I'm doing fine. Uh, of course, since uh, March 17, we had to close all the restaurants. Uh, we already saw the two weeks prior that the business went down for me 90%. Uh, and to be open only for the uh, delivery or pickup, being midtown was not worth it because uh, the offices are closed. MoMA is closed, Broadway is closed. So it's not a really uh, residential area. So also all our employees decided to close and stay home. How I see the future? Well, talking now about the real estate as a restaurateur, what I would like to, to propose to the landlord that they want to help us to work for the next two years on a kind of percentage rate, uh, rent. I was talking before with uh, Steve, probably they're gonna be partnering in our business, but if we wanted to survive for the next two years, we need a kind of deal that includes that. I make zero money, I pay zero money, I make $1 million, I pay a percentage on that. Regarding the PPP as the, uh, Bill said before, they are so confusing, so confusing and so messed up. Unfortunately, I do appreciate the fact that the government has been very fast to uh, give this money, but unfortunately it's been done not knowing the, the, the needs of the category, especially for the uh, hospitality industry. To use this money in the eight weeks, practically I got some funds May 1st, by June, uh, probably 30th, or even before I have to use the money. So what about if I don't open up? And what about once they are finished this money? I'm gonna be scared square one and I have to re-terminate everybody. And also one of the problems is gonna be that most of the people that they take uh, unemployment at the check for $600, probably for them it's much better to stay home than to come to work because the front of the house, not having the tips, uh, they're gonna be paid with the minimum wage for 40 hours, practically $600 gross. And they make no sense when they make in 1100 uh, uh, gross taking the two checks. It is a very scary moment but with the help of everybody and landlord and uh, of course the government re redoing the, 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 the rules of these PPP funds, I think we can do it. I am like a Steve Coates, I am an optimist. You know, I'm, a, I'm in the retail business in the morning, I open up the door and I hope that the people come in. So I am an optimist and I think that New York is a very resilient, you know, New Yorkers are very tough. Uh, I've been here for 36 years, so, so I saw uh, September 11, the several uh, crash of the, uh, uh, the, the stock market, and we went through that. So together, together, all of us, we can make it. Thank you for that. Um, we've got some questions in the Q&A, and I'm gonna try, I'm, I, I don't think we'll have time to address them individually, but. I'd like to present them as kind of topics and, and I'd offer anyone to um, jump in. One of them, and you alluded to it, uh, Jen Franco, it didn't make sense for you to pivot to takeout or delivery. Um, we've heard from chefs who just don't know how to cook to put into plastic. It's, it's, it's not, it's not, if you don't know anything about food or restaurants or logistics, you think, oh, why don't we just do this or we could do that or we could, all these sorts of things. But the realities of, of what you need, the skills you have to have, and whether or not the effort is worth it. And in this instance, whether it's worth um, the, the, the risk of, of, for your employees, the health risk. I mean, New York is, 
an amazing restaurant city. It is not the most spacious restaurant city, especially in the back of house. And so there are some very real considerations to take into account. And so, uh, and, and at the same time, I'll add another question to this. Um, so people, we, um, speak with are imagining a new model, of course, one that has perhaps more diversified revenue, uh, some takeout, some catering, some what have you, um, if dining rooms can't come back in full. And then also some people who wanted to do things differently because of regulations, because um, cities have relaxed alcohol laws, so you can now um, deliver cocktails with food, all these sorts of things it temporarily are changing, but there's a, there's a sense that more could change. This is the time, since everything's up in the air everywhere, now let's make the world as we want it to be rather than the world we had. And I just, from the, each of your perspectives, I know we have an employee specialist, we have a real estate specialist, we have a restaurateur. I'm wondering what would you, what, if, if you could, start now, as you know, with a, a clean slate, provided that we get through the survive thing, how would you rebuild? What do you think would be best for you from your perspective or from the constituency that you serve? Um, are there things that you um, would do more of, less of, or, or abandon altogether? Just curious from what you've seen and the people you've worked with. Uh, yeah, yes. please, please. No, you know, it's just so funny because we're talking Sorry. about pickup and we're talking about the delivery. And all my life I've been fighting with my guests, my customers saying, don't pick it up, don't, I don't want to do delivery because what about the risotto when it gets to your place after 25 minutes, you know? And now instead I have to promote the delivery, I have to promote the pickup. So the life is very strange. Of course, this moment we have to be very creative too. We have to find a new form of income. And that, as you said, it can be the delivery, it can be the, the, the catering, it can be uh, other things. Personally, you know, I don't like to see the tables empty in the restaurant or take away and have one in a corner, one in another corner. So what are we going to do? We're going to showcase our product on the table that separate other tables. And it's going to be also a form to sell our products. You know, we're going to have a basket and things like that. Uh, catering, we are doing also uh, targeting the Jewish community, which is very strong in New York, doing the Jewish Roman food at your place. You know, the, the artichoke Judea, things like that, appearing with the wines from uh, the Israel, etc. So I think this is a moment that we have to be also creative to find the new wave of income. Right. Others, Steve? Yeah. I, I was just going to uh, build off that, you know, um, the adaptability of restaurants here in Manhattan over the last two months has just been phenomenal. And it, it's not just delivery and takeout, uh, you know, John Franco is 100% right. Risotto after 20 minutes is not the same, but if you look at what Coat is doing and you look at what uh, Blue Hill is doing and, and meal kits basically, and getting into what Colicchio called in that New Yorker article, more of the food processing business than the restaurant business for the time being. I'm not suggesting that there's a real return on that investment, but they're doing it to keep their doors open and to keep their staff fed and paid and able to put food on their family's table. Mm -hmm. And it's an admirable effort and, and New Yorkers, and I uh, thought the coat um, meal kit, which is, you know, their banchan and some great steaks and, you know, basically instruction manual. John Franco, we could be doing that at Gattaparta where you've, you know, it's a, it's a build your own risotto kit, uh, much like Blue Apron. Um, mm -hmm. But th that, that's the adaptability conversation. The, the second thing you mentioned, Mitchell, is how we want to build the post-COVID world and what that looks like for restaurants and real estate. What I think is, is one of the great silver linings that inevitably will come out of this crisis is the heavy hand of government on restaurateurs and regulations and the Department of Health and the State Liquor Authority and the community boards. And in an effort to keep the lifeblood of New York around and alive and to keep it vibrant, I think those restrictions will inevitably be loosened. And I think once they get loosened, they probably don't get tightened again. So, you know, 
Whereas in community board two, it's nearly impossible to get a liquor license. I think the people on that community board are going to get really tired of seeing all these dark restaurant storefronts and realize that they have to loosen up. You know, the Department of Health restrictions, the, the Department of Buildings, Con Ed turning on the gas, all of these things that make the restaurant business even more difficult than it already is anywhere else in the world in New York. I'm hopeful that those entities and and public regulators uh, and and the city government will make it easier to operate restaurants in the future. Thanks, I appreciate that. From just, a uh, perspective, Bill. Yeah, just, just quickly, I mean, the employment aspect is extraordinarily complicated in terms of how what it should be. I, I, I think the really the comment that I'll make at this point is that the 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 concern for employers of liability to their employees for worker safety is going to be increased substantially as a result of this. Now that's true, of course, across the board. That's not particularly unique to restaurants, um, but I think people are gonna to need to keep an eye out for that. I know in my practice, I'm focusing more on that because it's going to be a big ticket item. And going back to a comment earlier about somebody made about depending on how the election goes in, in November, you know, um, if there's a democratic uh, election, I think the amount of worker protection legislation will skyrocket in rulemaking. And obviously, I think it'll be less so uh, if the status quo is maintained. But uh, it'll be very, very complicated and a lot. May, may I jump in with a question? Please. John Franco, Mitch, a practical question. Someday in the future, restaurants can reopen in New York City. How do you reopen a restaurant? You've got, let's say you have a restaurant with uh, 75 to 100 seats. You've laid off all your staff. It'll have been months since anybody worked there. What do you do? You try to rehire those people back? You put signs in the window? I don't know. I'll, st I'll take a first, just a, a scene setting. We've done a lot of polling um, at the Beard Foundation nationally um, every two weeks. It just happened when the first closures happened. We sent out a poll about business and what they were seeing. And as Jan Franco said, and Others have said, you know, even right before the mandates, um, business had dropped off because people don't want to eat out and so didn't want to eat out. Um, and we, very few restaurants have a clue how they're going to reopen, frankly. And one of the challenges about the PPEP that we hear is that money can only be spent in those in very limited ways. And people still have fish bills to pay. And, and then there's all the the added level of hygiene and, and uh, public safety stuff that's gonna have to happen. And the hardest part, frankly, is the uncertainty of timing because you're going to invest to do something, and this is not me speaking, you're going to invest to do something, you don't know when it's gonna change. People are hoping a vaccine changes people's behavior, but no one even knows if anyone's gonna come if you, and when you open. And so, I mean, I'll, I'll pass it to Gianfranco, but I, I, I think your quest, underlying your question is, reopen for what or why. Um, and I think we're in a moment now, eight weeks into this, where people are realizing um, that maybe not reopening is, is the way to go. And we're already starting to see permanent closures be announced in the news. Um, we're very aware of it as the, having just announced the nominees for the James Beard Awards this year, some were already uh, decided not to reopen for probably uh, investor financial reasons because there's just so long you can wait in the uncertainty. So uh, Gianfranco, uh, fr from your operator perspective, uh, well, uh, we, you know, we are in contact with our manager and our staff on uh, every other day. We have a Zoom meeting with our management and uh, we talk about that. Uh, personally, I don't think that before September is uh, feasible to open up. In September, if the schools open up, we're going to see in Manhattan more people coming in, getting back, because they have to have the kids at the school. But not having the hotels open, not having anybody traveling, and we have restaurants in Manhattan that they are Broadway dependent, Lincoln Center dependent, Times Square dependent, you know. I am uh, office dependent. Lunchtime for me is uh, the chairman, et cetera, et cetera, from the offices. So it's going to be very, very tough to survive. Regarding to hiring again, of course, uh, lots of people, they went back. I have people that went back to Italy, people that went back to South America. One guy went back to Serbia. So probably they're not going to come back to work. And we have to redo again, rehiring, training, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 
so it's going to be tough again. It's going to be very, very tough. And uh, when you were saying about the IRC uh, organization that they want $120 billion to stabilize the business, yes, because we need something on the long run. As I said before, we have to make sure that the landlord understand that and for the next two years, we're going to pay only on what we make, percentage rent. And then the staff, of course, we're going to start with the very minimum staff, you know, and, uh, and then according with the business, we're going to rehire more people. I guess there are going to be a lots of people unemployed that would be more than happy to come to work. But still, you have to uh, retrain them according with our uh, uh, procedure, our way to service, food, etc. So it's like uh, to open up again a new restaurant anyway. That, actually, your last point, I think, really resonates. It's like you're not just pausing a business and starting again. It's like reopening a restaurant and everyone knows how hard that is. That, that's written about all the time. Um, there, I think we have time for two more themes from the questions, and I apologize that I'm not going to be able to ask them uh, directly, specifically one for one, but I do think um, the way they come in, there are some common themes. Um, one of them is, and we haven't talked about this quite, um, I think something that has come to light um, and is certainly politically important is restaurants are not just about uh, a meal service, a lunch and dinner in a particular place, but they are this nexus of very vast systems of farmers and producers and liquor and beverage distributors. And um, uh, what's making me ask this is importers of products from Italy in this instance, um, a tremendous amount of economic and um, employment um, support that 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 makes restaurants thrive um, has ripple effects literally around the world, um, local economies and global economies, and and I think we're realizing that now when you stop them because the systems are so ingrained, um, it's not easy to pivot. You can't you can't. It's hard to go wholesale to retail. There are there are different channels. There are different price mechanisms. There's different packaging. There's different marketing. All sorts of things. And so I wonder if the panelists could speak a little bit to that. Um, um, you, Jan Franco, but um, for some of the audience, the, the sort of centrality of restaurants to this, this global network, uh, economic and, and personnel, I think is really key and has become to light. I'll just comment. I mean, I, I think it, 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 you're right. I mean, the, the IRC has been very good at, at publishing information statistically about the really the entire scope of what employment's involved, even if you look within the United States. Um, I think the one thing that's, and this goes back to some of the prior discussions that we've heard today, which is re-examining how these things work. And, you know, the, uh, what, what the fix is, I'm not sure that anybody knows, but for example, it points out the difficulty of having a fractured system of programs, whether it's state by state, city by city, and even to the extent it's not transnational, to the extent it's import-export. So, you know, I think maybe what this does is bring to light the importance of this, the, what the interconnected, interconnectedness is, and hopefully try to find a way to prevent this for the next time, knock on wood, something like this happens. Right. Um, I will, uh, I guess we have time for one more final comment, and I think we should um, change the focus a little bit. I know a lot of people out there want to help people who love restaurants, who eat in them, who um, miss their neighborhoods. And I'm wondering if you have any advice about what they can do, whether um, it's, it's buying merchandise, whether it's donating to the Open for Good Fund at the Beer Foundation, whether it's calling their congresspeople to take special um, care in addressing this sector of the economy or what have you. What, how can someone who really cares and who um, is able to help and is clearly not spending money in their restaurants right now, what could they do? Anyone? Well, I will say that whatever you said is fine. You already answered the, the, the question yourself, you know, gift card, uh, dinner for uh, other people, you know, uh, go found me for the employee. All these forms will help a lot our, our industry anyway. I would just add one more. Uh, if you're in New York or anywhere and you're getting delivery from or takeout from restaurants, do a favor, do them a favor and call them directly as opposed to using Seamless or Uber or Caviar. The fees are tremendously expensive. 
the it is not worth it for the restaurants to stay open if they have to pay Grubhub and Seamless 15 to 20 percent of every order. And I guess what I would add to that is is that you know given that your typically delivery tipping is generally done less than if you're sitting in a restaurant, but maybe this is the time to to think about your tipping of delivery folks more as if they're your server. Um, I, I just I, I'm aware of that as a practice for some folks, and you can tell the difference in, in people when they're making their delivery. Great. Thank you for all of that. Thank you for your time. I think we're, we're at uh, 401, one minute over, but um, a really interesting conversation that we could talk forever and, and uh, the subject matter changes every day practically um, at this point. Um, so I hope that uh, the Grupo Italiano and Gianfranco will arrange more of these conversations because I do think it really helps to talk it out. People feel very isolated and, and think they're fighting these things alone. Um, but um, the world is with us. Uh, so I appreciate your expertise and everyone. You're clearly all uh, supporters of the restaurant industry. Um, I can tell by how you eat and what you, what you, how you order. Um, so I appreciate that also. Thank you so much for inviting me to, to moderate. Thank you, everyone. And uh, as well, all the people that register to see this uh, webinar. Uh, I hope that you find this discussion informative and useful. Our next uh, webinar is going to be the 18th of May, in, in about two weeks, where we invited the Italian Trade Commissioner, Dottore La Spina. We invited the, the Gino Colangelo from the Colangelo Partner, expert in marketing and uh, of Italian products, and the, the, the director of the um, Economic Forum, uh, Italian Economic Forum, and we will talk how to support the Italian products, producer, uh, importer, distributor, and restaurateurs. So uh, we wish you a good night, and thank you very much, and see you in uh, two weeks' time. Thank you.